Hi there, this is Dillis Guyan from the Inspired Selling Podcast, uh, the place, of course, where people who sell to other businesses or to bigger businesses discover really how to be inspired to, to get in touch with clients and to give value and so on, and also to inspire the client to take action for them to be able to achieve their objective, their goals, whatever it is. And I've got another great guest for you today, the inimitable John Smybert. And <laughs> John is a, a B2B sales specialist, change agent, challenger, coach, trainer, speaker. If you cut him in two, that's just what he's got running through his veins. Um, John works with companies who are selling or sorry, are striving to grow high margin revenue by retaining customers and creating value for customers and strategically acquiring new customers. And, and I know John's going to talk to us a lot about value and about giving. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more. But before we move on to that, let me just tell you a little bit more about John. He's achieved 25 annual sales clubs uh, with IT multinationals selling to large banks, telcos, federal and state government, and the manufacturing industry. And he's led sales teams to success over the past 20 years. And this is in John's words, and I just want to emphasize this, this is John's words. He is one of the most switched on old heads in the rapidly changing world of B2B sales. And I had to stress that was your words, John. Welcome. I, I talk a lot about understanding your unique promise of value. And, and I, I'm an old guy. In fact, I'm retired. Yeah. My wife doesn't believe it, but I'm retired yeah. and I'm doing things because I have fun doing what I'm doing. I have fun doing. Um, and, and somebody asked me, what's your unique promise of value? So I just immediately responded for those words and thought, yeah, that sounds all right. <laughs> I yeah. wrote them in <laughs> LinkedIn the other day. So yeah. <laughs> interesting to hear them back for the first time. Yes. And I'm absolutely thrilled, John. People will hear, you know, that you haven't got a, a clear cut. British accent and that you're joining me today from Australia so I'm absolutely thrilled and uh, I've got a number of your colleagues in fact, who I've met through you who are joining me on this podcast and for, for, for your listeners out there Dillis let me let me tell you uh, Dillis had a holiday out here in Australia I think it was a holiday wasn't it it was yeah and I got a message saying I'm going to be in town and, and look if, if anybody's coming into Sydney and 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 you know holiday or whatever uh, and they they want to talk sales or talk whatever yeah just ring me up I'd love a cup of coffee or whatever but you know we had a great time we got together and, and I interviewed you a few times in the front of a video camera which uh, we've yeah. been publishing and and with great response by uh, my audience thank you yeah. very much yeah. oh it was a pleasure John it was it was if I dare say the highlight of my holiday I better again keep that a secret <laughs> from my husband really but yeah I met your wife Joan and we just got on like a house on fire. It was such a, a really lovely holiday and, and then getting the opportunity to come in and have conversations with you around B2B selling, which of course is a passion for both of us, I know. Um, so John, you- I guess we better get down to talking about something of value to your audience, eh? Absolutely. So you've worked with thousands of salespeople, um, and as I said, a ton of experience uh, selling B2B. And you've created many top performing sales teams and sales individuals. So what would you say uh, that these top salespeople demonstrate that the average salesperson doesn't? What qualities, what characteristics, what behaviours? First off, uh, I'm going to I'm just say they're givers. Okay. They like giving to others. The worst salespeople that I've ever worked with are the ones, the takers. Mm -hmm. I'm out there to get an order from this customer. And if that's the primary intent in their mind, I don't want them in my team. Yeah. Selling is about, in, in fact, for a lot of your audience, you may or may not know this, but the, the, the heritage of the word sell, there's an old English word, selen, and an old German word, selen, and the word sell derived from that, and salan means to give. Right. So, so selling is giving. 
and, and I hear a lot of people writing down on their on their on their profile a, 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 describe their role, and the word sales or sell isn't there. It's yeah. you know, account manager, account executive, uh, you know, you, all sorts of things um, without the word sales. Mm. I am so proud of being a salesperson Absolutely. because salespeople give, salespeople create value for others. Mm. And to me, it is, yeah, it's not obviously not as simple as that. But for me, if you get that intent and understanding and purpose behind, behind what you do, you'll be a world-class salesperson. Yes, it takes work, it yeah. takes practice, it takes you know, focus and so on. But that's the intent. Mm. And, and I, I love that, John, because I, I hear very often, I'm sure you have too, and people say, oh, well, I don't want to be seen as a salesperson, particularly business owners who are doing their, their own selling. I don't want to be seen as a salesperson. Well, actually, yes, you do. And, and you've given a great um, description there of the word sell and, and how it is about giving. And I always talk about when I'm working with an audience or an individual company that your mind will move to the most dominant thought, whether it's positive or negative, and your actions will follow. So if you are going in to see a client and your mind is set on how can I achieve my target? How can I get them to say yes today? How can I convince them that we are the best? then your actions will follow that. You will be seen to be more pushy and so on. If you can switch that thinking to one of customer focus, of how can I help my, my customer to achieve their objectives? How but, can and, I... And, and let's, let's also talk to the sales managers out there. Mm -hmm. because the sales managers have enormous impact on that mindset of, of their yeah. people. Uh, and, the thing that I hate hearing sales managers say, you know, every sales manager's got to put a forecast together and they're always wanting to know two things. Mm -hmm. How big is the deal and when's it going to close? Yeah. And what question do a lot of sales ma managers ask their salespeople? Exactly that question. Mm -hmm. How big is it and when's it going to close? Yeah. And what, what does that depict in the behaviour? How does a salesperson react to that? Well, the salespeople that, are not real givers or haven't got their mindset, of course, they're going to go out and what are they going to say to the customer? How big is it and when can you give it to me? Yeah. Right, And that's all their behaviour. Mm -hmm. So the behaviour starts at the top and works down. But if we're talking to individual salespeople right now, it doesn't matter what your sales manager says or does, you need to get your mindset right. And that's all around the customer and how you can help the customer, how you can create value from mm -hmm. the customers from their perspective. It's not the value you think you bring to the table. It's helping them go through a thinking process to ultimately get to an outcome that creates value for them. And, and, and we create value in every conversation if we're a good salesperson. So you, you talk about a measure of a good salesperson. Every good salesperson I know, know absolutely are committed to how do I create value through the conversation I have, every conversation I do have. Yes, exactly. And, and if you've got the wrong mindset, you'll be, you'll be behaving in a way that I'm trying to get and the customer will immediately say, I'm not getting value out of this conversation. Mm. Because the, 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 the buyers are much more discerning these days, aren't they? They're looking for much more. You know, gone are the days of the encyclopedia salesperson who had to go round with the case full of encyclopedias to be able to demonstrate because there was no internet. There was no facility for people to be able to have a look at products. And, and they're not waiting for you going along to, to demonstrate product. Uh, absolutely. So in the world of, I mean, you've just started touching on the subject, but in the world of sales, is dramatically changing and unfortunately too, too many people aren't recognizing it. There is a tsunami of change coming through uh, and it's not just in sales, it's in, in, a, in a whole world. I, I'm, I talk to futurists all the time, so we talk about uh, what society is going to look like when we have autonomous cars, driverless cars. Yeah, yeah. Saying, yes, in 20 or 30 years or 40 years, that may have an impact. Well, guys, 
I, I think that's happening much more quickly than that. And, and you know, other things are happening around the world that, that are really going to reshape the way we think, the way we work and so on. And the impact of all of that on, on how people make decisions, uh, how organisations make decisions and what drives those decisions are dramatically changing. And, we, you know, that tsunami is coming through. We've got to learn how to ride that tsunami. Mm. Can you give us some examples there, John? Because this is a really interesting subject that actually a lot of people don't even address. Lots of examples. The, 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 uh, there's some numbers flying around at the moment, research numbers, uh, about uh, how business-to-business -business transactions occur. Now, a lot of salespeople really have been transaction managers. Mm. And the reality is, very quickly, any transaction that's happening is happening automatic, automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, technology is handling the management of transactions. So if, if, if I'm sitting in a job where a large proportion, proportion of what I do is, is say to the customer how many today and fill in a form or put it into an iPad or whatever and send the order off, your job's gone. Mm -hmm. right? And in fact, a lot of those jobs have already gone. Mm -hmm. So it, it really comes down to if you want to survive in this world, you need to move into roles where it's really important that, that we create value for the customer through the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, from an example point of view, um, there's lots of examples. If you, if you talk about the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, you talk about anybody, a lot of the medical industries that we, we sell to these days, um, uh, in, in my area in technology, um, now we software. We used to have to sell these big software packages, and you'd get the, the license right up front. And, and it's all cloud-based now. It's all uh, subscription-based, and so on. So we can't walk in the door, sell us a, a software solution, and expect to get ten, fifteen, twenty millions up dollars up front. Yeah. We're probably only going to get a few thousand dollars now, and a few thousand next month, and a few thousand the following month different thinking required altogether. So how do we do that? It's again coming back to how do we create value for the customer? Or how do we help the customer create value for themselves? Mm. How do we do that? I mean, I'll keep saying how the cows come home, but basically uh, the, the, the top salespeople today, uh, they have a, 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 an absolute commitment to becoming an expert in some area of the customer's domain. Mm. And if you don't, how do you create value for the customer? Yeah. How do you bring unique insight to the table if you don't understand the customer's domain and understand what unique insight then would match to that domain and create value for the customer through the conversation? Mm. Right. Exactly. So domain expertise is absolutely critical and every top salesperson I know has great domain expertise. Yeah. Now, just for those who may not understand uh, your reference to domain expertise, what, what do you mean by that? I know, okay, what you mean, if but if you just explain that, if, if <laughs> I'm selling, uh, if my territory is the banking, banking finance, mm. uh, and, and it depends what we sell. Let, let me say, let's say I'm selling uh, security solutions to banking and finance, software services, whatever. Um, a lot of us think I have to be an expert in my security software. I have to be an expert in my services. But can I suggest out there that? it is 100% more important to be an expert in banking and understanding the issues the banks are facing in relation to security from their perspective, yeah. right? Exactly. Uh, and once you understand that, then you can look for lots of opportunities to bring insight to the table. Mm. Now, a lot, a lot of salespeople say, how do I ever bring insight to the table? And, you know, I'm talking to a banker here and trying to make out on the domain expert, but where am I gonna get the insight? Well, the fact is, as a salespeople, we have more insight that we see that's of value to our customers than the customers ever will. Because we're talking to, if we're selling to the banking industry, we're talking to lots, lots and lots of bankers. Mm -hmm. And all of them are talking about how they solve problems. Exactly. Now I can bring some of those to this new banker I'm just talking to. Mm. That's some insight. And of course, I'm not going to tell him all about it. And I'm going to couch that in the way I ask questions. Mm. I was talking to somebody recently who sounded like he had a problem similar to yours and he was addressing it this way and, and the outcomes were like this. Would that make sense in your environment? Tell me how that might apply. Yeah, exactly. Right? All about mm. them. All about them. All about them. Yeah. All about them. And, and yeah, the best salespeople, 
the people that are flawed with this, but the best salespeople, they don't talk about their product or service. Mm. Now, I, I always just said that as if you never do. Now, obviously, you have to get to talking about your product or service, but that's right down the sales yes, process. Absolutely. Way yeah. down. Yeah. So in, in your approach, in the, in the way you engage in the early stages, and then once you get a commitment to do a discovery and really understand the customer and, and get in and do all your insightful questioning and so on, and then for to, through the process of developing your value proposition, mm -hmm. Not once do you discuss your product in any of those three stages of the sales process. Okay. Once you've got agreement on what the value proposition is, now you can start to talking about well, how can how can you achieve that value proposition, Mr. Customer? And I'm using the word proposition, but it's not proposing product; it's proposing how they can change their business. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And that's the key. Yes, yes in, indeed, and and yet. John, we're still seeing people going out there talking product right from the outset. And, and you hit the nail on the head before because this has to come from higher. It has to come from the company down. And I'm seeing that is missing in, I would say, the majority of, of the clients that I work with, that there is still this uh, jumping. But with the successful salespeople, and, and I'm just thinking of, of one in particular, uh, a, a bank that I was working with and, and one of their top salespeople, for the week that I was working with them, he was in the lounge every morning doing a half hour of research on his market, so not just the, not just the client, but on the, on the world in which they operate. And, and he was head and shoulders above all of the other salespeople. Right. I, I would I would suggest that that person had developed themselves to be a domain expert mm -hmm. and the research would have been largely around his target customers and the industry they're operating in and what's happening in that industry and, and how I can bring unique insight to the table. And obviously, how that might relate to the product or service that I'm able to bring to the table because if I'm going to introduce unique insight, where is that going to lead the customer's thinking and can I help the customer then achieve yeah. the change that's necessary to get that value? Yeah. Right. So obviously that whole ties together, but the focus is first on the customer. Mm -hmm. So and we've got then, yeah. So we've got the mindset, which which really is the foundation, isn't it? And, and then, if you've got that mindset, then you you're going to research because you understand the value of it, right? Exactly. Uh, this is what uh, I was talking about before about your mind moves the most dominant thought, positive or negative, and your actions follow. So having that right mindset of uh, customer first. I, I've got a, um, a friend and uh, has been, not as old as I am, but he's been around a long time. Uh, and he, uh, he's been a salesperson for a long time. Uh, and, you know, every company he's worked for, he's worked for five or six companies in the last few years, uh, have, have wanted to train him in their products. <laughs> he says, I don't want to know about, do you know why he doesn't not want to know about the products? Because the product train, training tends to change his mindset. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. so tell me more about your customers. Tell me more about the challenges they're facing. Let me understand what some of the, your other customers are doing to address those sort of problems, but yeah. without talking about your product. Yeah. And if he understands that, he'll go and talk to the customers, bring unique, unique insight to the table. When he identifies where all the challenges are and, and how they might be able to change to get the value, then he'll go back to his company and say, hey, have we got anything that will help the customer achieve this? Yes. He's done the sales job. Now you can bring the product expertise in. Yeah, yeah. And, and John, you know, if you, if you look at a typical company who's, who, who's employing salespeople, it's no wonder that they talk product because they become employed and they get this much product training. They get that much sales training and they get that much in prospect training. And, and then they get the target, they don't achieve their target because they haven't been, they're, they're, they're so full of product and then talking I about... I wonder why the customer they, doesn't want to talk to them. Yeah. Exactly. They don't achieve their target, they get despondent, the, the manager gets heavy with them, they lose their confidence, 
they start to become negative and eventually they leave. And I read some statistics recently that said 18.6% of salespeople will leave their company every year. Now that is tragic in a massive financial the, 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 stat, the stat I saw the other day is the average um, tenure of a salesperson is 1.7 years. And, and it, if companies that are, are, are running that way, obviously that's no value for their company, let alone their customers. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Can't, you can't bring, particularly in the more complex sort of selling that I work in, mm -hmm. you can't bring a salesperson in. Even if they're a very experienced salesperson, you can't bring them in, help them understand the customer base, the, the unique insights that are bring to the mm -hmm. table, help them be a domain expert, expert and all that sort of stuff and get them productive, particularly when lead times tend to be yeah. about six or 12 months. Um, in, in 17 or 18 months. Mm. Yeah. They might be getting their first order through the door and they're out the door and going on to the next one. Exactly. And, and they're going out very often feeling negative towards the company they've just been employed by. But because they're a salesperson by profession, they join another company, but they go through rinse and repeat. Yeah, so it's, it's very unfortunate. I, 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 um, despite all that research, I've got to say, I know some very good companies that are very competent and they do get a much uh, longer tenure on average mm -hmm. with their salespeople and so on. Um, so it can be done uh, and it must be done uh, for those to survive. Uh, it's really important to develop a, a, a culture of purpose in the sales organisation, well, in the whole organisation, but in the sales organisation, that culture of purpose has to be focused on the customer experience. Yeah, That's what it's all about. Uh, now, that, they're very easy words to say. Have we got a culture of purpose that's focused on customer experience? Mm. Everybody says, yes, it's on the, on the board, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the reality is to change the organisation and the mindset of the individuals in the organisation, it's a long process mm. if you're typically being a product sales organisation. It's a long process to change to that culture of purpose. Mm. But if you haven't started, start now. Because uh, you, your organisations, the organisations that don't have that culture of purpose, the customer experience, will not survive as a tsunami washes through us. Yeah, completely. You know, custom, yeah. Customers have no interest in dealing with people that want to talk about their products. Yeah. And it's about keeping that mess. I, I call it keeping the red paint red. It's about keeping that message of customer focus running through the, the company like lifeblood really and and everybody embracing that that same uh, behavior. calling out bad behavior yes calling out beha bad behavior up and down um i encourage you know a lot of the, the change programs i put in place i encourage the sales teams one to get their mind right first but call out bad behavior that their sales manager yeah because the sales manager is getting this push and should be getting the right culture build into the yes. outfit they're thinking and if they start asking questions like i asked like I mentioned before you know how big is the deal and when is it going to close wrong behavior yes. mr manager sorry i'm not going to answer that question i'll answer a few other questions if you want to ask me uh, what what value is a customer going to get out at the end of this process uh, how is it going to make a difference to their business why is it important to them uh, what's their timeline for achieving that Mm. Uh, and, you know, when when is it, when, when do they want to see value flowing out of the implementation? And let's work back from that from when they make make the decision. And, and what are the steps they're going to go through in their buying journey? They're all great questions. Yeah, they're customer oriented questions. Yeah, but how's big? How big is the deal? And when is it going to close? Mm. Is supplier oriented question and demonstrates the wrong behaviour and the wrong mindset. Yeah. You've just brought up a great subject there, John. I'd like to just explore that a little bit more in terms of the buyer's journey. Uh, and, yes. and the importance of aligning with that buyer's journey. So, so talk to us about that and, and, and let's get a little bit deeper into that because it, it really is so important, isn't it, to, to align with that? It, 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 it's part of being, being uh, customer-oriented and driving, uh, driving towards the best customer experience. Mm. Um, so, a lot of old salespeople, are, you know, that are very committed to a sales process, and sales process is good. I'm not saying it's not good, but they're very committed to their process. Feel they've got to take the customer through their process. Mm. 
So the first thing we do is, is open the door and build rapport. Second thing we do is maybe they call it discovery, whatever, but we do re research and rediscovery in the organisation and then we develop a, a proposal and then we do a demonstration and then you know, we, we negotiate and close or whatever the, the process is. And Mr. Customer, this is the process I'm going to take you through. Well, the react, that's not customer focused. So what do we do? A lot of these people are very worried. If we give the customer the reins, the customer will go and take us in the wrong direction. Yeah. Well, it, it, the customer has got to be honoured and, 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 and respected uh, that they, they have the authority, they have, it's them and their business and, and they're going to go through a process to make a decision to address a particular challenge or opportunity they've got. Yeah. So why not ask the question? What, are the, what steps are you going to go through in evaluating this challenge and working out how are you going to address it, Mr. Customer, and have you got a timeline? And how can we help you through that process? Exactly. It's a change of thinking, isn't it? Yes. It's customer-focused thinking. Mm. Now, you talk about alignment. Well, when we know what the customer is going through, what their timelines are, assuming we find that out, and, and customers, once we've established rapport, we've established that we're there to help them and they sense that we're not there to get an order. Mm. They're much more open to talking about, yes, well, you can help me. Here's what we're trying to get through and here's where I've got challenges in my part of that decision-making and I've got a committee over here with you know, 6.7 people yeah. on it or whatever uh, that I'm mm. trying to, I need to get that decision passed through and so on. So you could help me with this and that and this and that and any other ways I can help you. So that sort of dialogue mm. is, is very customer-focused and you'll find customers warm to you and get much more trusting in the fact that you're a consultant here to help them through a process. Yeah. You're a consultant to help them get to the right decisions. Mm. And if your product happens to help them do that, then maybe your product will be part of it. Mm. That's the attitude. We're now. now, obviously, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking to a customer when my product's not going to be part of it. So managing that and managing reciprocity yeah. is a vital part and a vital skill that salespeople need. Mm. We, and, yes, we need to be givers, but we need to manage reciprocity. Yeah. And the okay. successful salesperson will, you know, you talked about a committee, which is often the case with the, biggest, with the bigger, more complex sales. And they will navigate their way around that. They will understand the committee. They will understand who's involved. They will understand the the benefits to each of those people within that committee or in some cases they may not but they will work out how they'll help the in the, in the case of the challenger people the mobilizer help mm -hmm. cajole those people into a decision so whether they're doing it directly or they're helping a mobilizer do it doesn't really matter yes they understand that's yes. where the challenges are and they know that they have a role in helping them go through that decision process yeah, and, and they're, they're very aware of these things. And what I've always found fascinating too, if you, if you look into teams, you've got silos of, of, of information and intelligence where they're not being encouraged to share. And so everybody's got their own bit of intelligence. But if, if, the, if the manager would create an environment where people would share these insights, share the knowledge, they could actually grow the team. But it, it's, it's often overlooked. Part of this tsunami of change is happening, of course, for us to respond to it. We need to be much better at team selling. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the salesperson out there slaying the dragon all on their own and dragging it into the company. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a team approach. And you're right, if, if you're operating in silos mm -hmm. and it's very hard for information or people to move across silos, then you won't have the ability to drive a good customer experience. Yeah. So, so breaking down those silos and, and making it very, uh, very easy for people to be formed into teams, you know, whether they're real teams or, or virtual teams or whatever, mm -hmm. but working together understanding and this takes a lot of skill by a lot of people to, to collaboratively work together towards getting the end result now the salesperson has a very important role in mm. that but now the salesperson has to be a very good people manager yeah right and a, and a, and a very good leader 
mm-hmm. in what they do. And that's a skill a lot of salespeople haven't got, so they need to develop it as this tsunami of change comes through. Yeah. What would be your sort of key points then to trying to develop that, John? Um, at an organisational point of view or, or an individual point of view? Just sharing of intelligence, you know, so that, okay. we, so that we break down these silos. Uh, to, to have efficient running of an organisation, you need some level of structure. So you've always got that danger of silos occurring. However, you need from the top an empowerment happening for people to be empowered, if I need something done for my customer, particularly if it's for my customer, mm-hmm. I should have the empowerment to talk to anybody in my corporation that I think might be able to help me with that. And their response should be, I'm delighted you brought that to me, right? And I really feel priv- privileged that you think I can help you with your customer. Mm. That's the culture that's got to be developed, but it's an empowerment culture from the top down. It's got to be encouraged to say anybody can talk to anybody in this organisation. And as soon as you get behaviour that that goes against that, you've got to have a system where it's called out in a nice way Mm -hmm. because you'll get ahead of a silo saying, you're too busy here. I don't want you talking to that person over there, right, Mm -hmm. because I, I need you to deliver something over here. Well, yeah, you know, that person instead has to say, well, okay, that's obviously important. It's a customer thing. You've got the skill and the capability of helping that. How can I fill the gap or how can I help you do that? And how can we backfill on this one? And mm-hmm. let's work out how it can be done. Because across the board, it's the customer that counts. Yeah. And as soon as I start saying, you can't work on helping that, even though you're the best person to do it, and helping that person drive value for that customer, we've got the blockage is starting to happen in the organisation. Yeah. So the, the, it's top down mm-hmm. and it requires a change program to rethink training uh, and putting in collaborative systems and, and a whole host of other things. Mm. But you still need strong leadership across all those areas to drive that change. And, and, and I've got to say, when you find people that won't change, leaders particularly, I'm sorry they've got to go. Mm. It, because you cannot, you haven't got time to try and get a leader to change over three or four years. They can't change in six months Mm. and and rethink the way they support the organisation. I'm sorry, they've got to go. Yeah. And for me, the leaders are are like the key component in the business because however they are, the team will be. So if they are focused on self, on them achieving their team numbers and so on, that's what they will create in the team. So the, the, these sales leaders are key crucial to the success of, of businesses. If, if, if your team have a clear idea of where we're trying to go, mm-hmm. uh, what we're trying to do with our customers and driving customer, uh, achieving customer expectations and so on, uh, and that's, there's clarity in that, and our goals and so on, and then you empower them to do whatever they need to do to achieve that and support them in doing that. You don't have to tell them what to do. You don't have to measure in results. It will happen. You help Mm -hmm. them understand the the tasks. that Yeah, sales is is classic. There's a a whole lot of activities that need to be performed starting right early in a sales process. You need to be able to be working with your salespeople as the manager. So how are you going, you Mm -hmm. know, engaging with customers right at the beginning how are you going with discovery let me ride shotgun with you in some meetings Mm -hmm. right and that's ride shotgun it's not taking over right Uh, and you need to define in each one of those meetings what role am i going to have as a sales manager and what's your role as a salesperson but you need to let that salesperson take the risk of failing yes it's empowerment and 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 we as managers you're right we don't achieve the end result all our people achieve the exactly they need to be empowered to do that and we need to give them the respect that they deserve that they're going to go out and do their best to do that yeah absolutely john i could talk to you all day i absolutely <laughs> could so <laughs> we must talk again at some point i love hearing your insights so if any of our listeners or viewers would like to get in touch with you john how might they do that 
Well, there's a, there's a few ways. Uh, one is I run a, a group called the Strategic Selling Group. So go on to LinkedIn uh, and join the Strategic Selling Group. There's, there's some really, particularly if you're in larger B2B, complex B2B and so on, that group's very, very good in that area and you can have lots of good dialogue. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I guess um, if, you, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, so find me on LinkedIn and just sit and connect. Uh, anybody that's a sales leader or a sales manager, I'll accept. I mean, if you've got nothing to do with that, I'll question why you're trying to connect with me. Yeah. Uh, and if there's anything I can do. I run resource centres. I, I have uh, a, a YouTube channel uh, interviewing people like you, Gadillis, and a whole lot of other brilliant people. All of those resources, they're free of charge. As I said, I'm in retirement. And I'm trying to do what I can to give back. So there's lots of stuff there. Just find me on LinkedIn. I'm, I think I'm probably the only John Smybird on LinkedIn uh, and certainly the only one in Sydney. So um, just find me and connect. Yeah, that'll give me uh, give you my phone numbers and uh, email addresses and so on. That's the best Perfect. One. And I would endorse all of that. Your groups, your videos, the interviews you do, are such a huge contribution to your sales. sales. You're so beautiful, Dillis. Thank you very much. John Spiper, <laughs> you're making me blush. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's my delight. I love doing that sort of stuff and I really do hope uh, people get value out of it. And if, if people want me to interview anybody in particular uh, or, or want to know more about a particular subject where I have interviewed somebody, um, just let me know and, and I'll chase it up and, and uh, we'll maybe do another interview with somebody. Fantastic. Have a great, well, a great evening, John. I've yes. got the rest, of the, day, the rest of the day ahead of me, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dillis. I really enjoyed it. Look forward to the next time. Bye for now. Bye.